Genesis chapter 19. This morning I'm going to address a subject that I don't know of another subject that has been so subtly injected into the culture of all people than the subject that I want to talk to you about this morning. It's a subject that the church in general, I don't think, has done an adequate job of addressing over the years, and I'm included in that. I don't think I've done an adequate job of addressing this subject wholly. But it's certainly something that needs to be on our minds, and we need to understand how it applies to us as a local church of God's people, local churches everywhere. You know, sometimes as God's people, we, we treat certain subjects like giving a vaccine. We give it a vaccine, and we think we've killed it, and we took, we've taken care of it, we're not going to have to ever worry about it. Well, all of us understand that vaccines just don't work that way, do they? At least over the last few years, I think we've all come to understand that just because you get a vaccine doesn't exactly mean it's going to keep you from having to deal with some certain sickness. And sometimes when we give something a shot of truth, and maybe we give it a shot of truth over and over again, it does not mean that we've entirely killed the sickness and we're never ever going to have to deal with it again. And the subject that I want to address this morning, we have probably done that more than any other subject, I do believe. I'll say again, I've been guilty of that myself. I want to talk to you about this morning is addressing homosexuality and how it applies to the Lord's church. As we begin this morning, let's just begin first of all by Just asking the question, is it a sin? I think we must start there very simply in a a very base place. Is homosexuality a sin? Well, let's just start by asking, well, how has God felt about it historically? Well, I can walk back to Genesis chapter 19, and I can find the, the true story of Sodom and Gomorrah and how the Lord had revealed Himself to Abraham in chapter 18 and told Abraham about his intentions to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham tried to reason with the Lord. The Lord, he got to the point to say, if we could just find ten, just ten that are righteous there, will you spare the place? God said he would. If we could just find ten righteous people. Two angels are sent on into Sodom to see if we can find ten righteous people. Those two angels come into the city They come to Lot's house and finally give in to Lot's request to come in. So in chapter 19, and beginning in verse 5, let's just begin in verse 4. Before the angels came in and laid down in Lot's house, it says, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. If there's any vagueness there to you, these are the men of the city calling for the men that they saw go into Lot's house and he wants Lot to deliver them to them so they can know them carnally in a homosexual way. And in verse 12, the angels say to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in this city? Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Why? Can you hold your place here in the Old Testament and turn over to the book of Jude? That little epistle that has one chapter right before Revelation. Jude's epistle, and notice what Jude says in verse 7. If there's any vagueness, let's let Jude clear it up as he's speaking of things that are erroneous, consequences of error and sin. Verse 7, he says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, 
are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. We understand what was going on. The primary sin that was being conducted in Sodom and Gomorrah was obviously homosexual sin. And God destroyed that city because of it, because He was not pleased with what was taking place there. Well, the law of Moses came along later on when the children of Israel were led out of Egypt, which brings us to Leviticus chapter 18. And as Moses is receiving the law from God, and God is trying to express to His people different areas, the way they're going to live their life and what He expected of them, He had certain laws that were in regard to sexual purity and how they conducted themselves in those ways. In Leviticus chapter 18, Notice with me in verse 22. God said, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. If anyone is unclear about what an abomination is, it's something that's highly detestable. How did God feel about homosexuality in the time of Moses and the children of Israel? He said, It's an abomination to me. It's something that's highly detestable before my sight. And over in chapter 20, And in verse 13, if that wasn't already clear enough, God says again, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So under the law of Moses, the act of homosexuality was an abomination in the eyes of God. It was something that was punishable by the penalty of death. God wasn't pleased with it. He didn't accept it. He saw it as a sin. Well, I, I realize, and some people will, will try to reason themselves, well, well, that was under the law of Moses. A lot of things have changed since then. God has some things in place that are different from the old covenant to the new, and that's right. He has. There's a lot of things that have changed. Has God's position on homosexuality changed from the old covenant to the new? Well, let's examine that. Let's go to our Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1. Paul writing here, beginning in verse 18, speaking generally to the the men of the world, the Gentile world. Everybody had, had evidence to know there was God, even the Gentile. But it doesn't mean that they had accepted it. Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creator rather a creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. If you come back to verse 18, Paul writes that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the unrighteousness and the ungodliness of men. Why? Because they suppressed the truth. Did they know the truth of God? Yes. What did they do with it? Well, they suppressed it. They pushed it down. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. But it was always there right in front of their eyes. The invisible attributes of the creation there are clearly seen. God's written all over creation. They couldn't miss it. And God said they didn't miss it. They were without excuse. But they were not thankful. They did not glorify God. No, they allowed their thoughts to be darkened and their hearts to be darkened as well. Oh, they profess to be wise, but really they're nothing but fools. And what did they do? 
Well, they didn't serve the Creator. But in their foolish thoughts, in their darkened hearts, they turned to idolatry and they worshiped the very creature like themselves that God created. And what did, do? What did God do? Verse 24 said God gave them up. You see, beware. If you suppress the truth of God at any point and you continue to suppress the truth, you'll go further and further down the line of suppressing truth and walking away from it, and eventually God will let you go down that path. He doesn't want you to go, but He will not hold you against your own will. He'll allow you to make your own choices, and if you choose sin, you'll get worse and worse and worse. How much worse did they get? What did the idolatry lead them to? Well, the idolatry led them to exchange the truth of God for nothing but a lie. And then God gave them up to even more vile passions. And those vile passions led them in to homosexuality. And God says that homosexuality in verse 24 is dishonorable. He says the homosexuality in verse 26 is just that. It's a vile passion. He said in verse 27, it is shameful and they'll receive a penalty for that error. Is God pleased with homosexuality under the new covenant? No, He's not. Not at all. And the error here is exchanging God for something of far less importance. The error here was suppressing the truth. And the penalty for suppressing the truth, walking away from God, was God giving them up and letting them fall further and further into sin. You know what the penalty was? Living a life and practicing homosexuality. Why? Because it's shameful. It's dishonorable and it's vile. You can find no honor in living and practicing a life of homosexuality. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. We all know people who have been given over to the practice of homosexuality. They put their lives on social media like everything's great and good, but if you know them personally and individually, they're miserable. Their life is a wreck. They complain, and they're always mad about something, and they're always protesting themselves. Why? Because they are living in a state where they are, are unnatural and it's caused them to live a lie. There is no honor in living a lie. There is no honor in living vile. It's a shameful place to be. And if, you turn, if you'll hold your place here and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Hold, hold your place at Romans 1, please. 1 Corinthians 6 paints the picture a little clearer for us. We'll pick up in verse 9. When Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Paul writes here, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Within this list, what do you find? You find homosexuals and sodomites. And he says, these cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Can the kingdom of God here be twofold? Well, let's let it be twofold. Can homosexuals become a member of the body of Christ? Will the Lord add them to the universal church? Well, Paul says no. Well, if it's talking about even furthermore, the kingdom of heaven itself, being in the dwelling place of God, can a practicing homosexual go and be a part of the dwelling place of God in heaven? Well, the answer is no. No. The Lord will not add you to His church if you are practicing such unrighteousness, just like all His other unrighteousness that's here. And it will not allow you to go to heaven. Strong, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, friends and brethren, we all must come to an understanding of what God's will is on homosexuality. The question that we ask first is homosexuality a sin? And the answer to that question, based on what the Bible says, is an absolute yes. It will keep you from fellowship with God, and it will keep you out of heaven. Now let me move secondly to ask this question. Is it affecting the Lord's church? It's a good question. And the answer to that is yes. Absolutely, yes. You may ask why. Why is it affecting the Lord's church? The same reason it's affecting every place and everywhere. 
It's because of the general normalization of it in society as a whole. And it's no different among church-going people. There is a group, a research group, called Statista, and they did a research poll, which was done July 5th of this year. July 5th of this year, that poll said, now I know this is broad, among all church-going people, in 2006, the number of church-going people that supported same-sex marriage was 19%. Among all church-going people in 2006. In 2023, the number of church-going people that supported same-sex marriage was 67%. And brethren, don't you think that we don't fall into that category somewhere? As a matter of fact, we do. A Pew Research poll done among Churches of Christ showed that members of the Church of Christ that support same-sex marriage is 35%. Now, I know that's broad, too, among all Churches of Christ, but don't you think we don't fall into that percentage somewhere, somehow? 35%. Is it affecting the Lord's Church? It's most certainly affecting the Lord's Church. Can we ask the question, why again? Why? What's one of the main reasons that this has come to be? Why this general normalization in society? Why is it taking place? Do you know where it all began? The old all-American sitcom. And all the family sits around and watches the, the wonderful all-American sitcom. Let me take you on a little tour of history of the sitcom in regard to this subject. 1971, you remember All in the Family? Archie Bunker. Do you know that sitcom was one of the most popular sitcoms in the early 70s? That was the first time on a sitcom that there was an open homosexual character, a man, and he was portrayed to be the all-American football playing guy. And by the time that the sitcom was over, he had come out openly to Archie that he was homosexual. 1971. 1977. Remember the Jeffersons? First time on a sitcom that a trans person had been introduced to America. And on that show, one of George Jefferson's friends, who used to be Eddie, was now Edie. And George had a fit at first, but by the time the show was over, guess what? It's okay to be Edie. It's okay to be trans. 1977. How many people in the United States sat around and watched? and are continuing to watch that same show. 1986, you remember the Golden Girls? Some of you are shaking your head. First time that an openly gay lesbian character was portrayed to America. One of Dorothy's friends. She even had a crush on Rose. By the end of the show, it's portrayed that being a lesbian, it's okay. 1991, you remember Roseanne? What's interesting about the shift from 86 to 91 is Roseanne had the first bisexual character that continued through the episode over and over again. So what are we now seeing? We're now seeing the portrayal of homosexuality in a regular interval. Guess what happens in 94? Guess what comes on the scene in 94? Friends. If you're my age, you grew up with it. And what were you introduced to for the first time on Friends? Two lesbians who were raising a child together, married. And how many of us still today sit around and watch Friends? They're sitcoms. What did Satan have to do? Satan didn't have to convince us that it was the most, you know, it's just the most terrible thing, and you know, you gotta rebel and gotta run against this. All he had to do was get us to laugh at it. If Satan can get you to laugh at it over and over again, sitting around your living room with your children there present, then indirectly what's happening is it's becoming normal. And the more I laugh at it, it becomes normal. And though I may say with my mouth that it's a sin, my actions when I look at it and I laugh at it and I bring it into my living room over the years, what's happened? It's become normal. And today in 2024, oh man, what do we see? 
We've got homosexuals making out in the commercials on our TV screen. We pull up social media, or you may pull up social media, and there's no telling what you see portrayed there. And what Satan's been able to do is just very subtly, all over this time, just make it like it's no big deal. You know, murder's not that way. You go watch a sitcom today, murder's still wrong, isn't it? It's still wrong to steal from someone. Even the homosexuals that are playing the characters in these shows, they don't want you to murder anyone. They don't want you to steal. But what has Satan been able to do with adultery, fornication, and our subject this morning? He's introduced it in a way that we're, we're all just kind of okay with it, even though we may not say that we are. We'll all sit around and laugh at it, though. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Turn back to Romans 1 with me just a second. Not only did Paul say that homosexuality was dishonorable, it was shameful, it was vile. There was a penalty for that error. But look at verse 32. Along with that, with another, all other list of unrighteous activity, he says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. You know what the point is of verse 32? that I may not practice homosexuality. But if I in some way approve of it, even directly, I'm worthy of the same punishment as those who are practicing such. Let me be careful. Let me be careful. Brethren, let me ask you one more time. Is homosexuality affecting the Lord's church? It is most certainly affecting the Lord's church. And we need to be aware of it. Thirdly and finally, one more question. What must we do? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What must we do? Well, let me tell you this. Our adversary, the devil, is like a roaming lion. He walks about seeking whom he may devour. Well, this understanding that this is culturally saturated in our society, and it's also permeating, not into all religious people, but also into members of the Lord's body. We must understand that we can't turn a blind eye to it. It gets back to where I was, what I was speaking of in the introduction. We sometimes, and I sometimes, have come to the pulpit and condemned homosexuality as a sin. Gave it a shot of truth to you. And it's going to be exempt from everyone's life, right? Yeah. Wrong. It's not that easy, is it? I can't, I can't as a Christian, and you can't as a Christian. We can't as a local church, nor can any other local church turn a blind eye to homosexuality, its influence and its power. The way it's crept into society now, it's not subtle anymore. It's everywhere. You got kids in school that are middle school and high school age, talk to them about it. Ask them about what's going on at school. It's there. And it's strong. What must we do? We can't turn a blind eye to it thinking it's not going to happen to someone here. To think just because we've got, given them a shot of truth over all these years, we've scared it out of them and they're not going to be able to fall victim to that. Yes, they can. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul's dealing with another issue, but I'd like to make a comparison to it. In Thessalonica at this time, there were false teachers that were teaching things about the second coming of Jesus that weren't true. And a lot of brethren were confused. They lacked understanding, and Paul started toward the end of chapter 4 to try to clear up some of the mess about the second coming of Jesus. And notice what he says, in chapter 4, concerning the second coming of the Lord. Let's just back up to verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as the thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and labor pains upon pregnant women, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. 
You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Considering the issue of the second coming of Jesus. People were teaching false things about that. Some were teaching that if you had died before Jesus comes back and you're going to miss second coming, you're not going to go to heaven. Paul said, wrong. That's not right. And obviously there were other things that were being scattered around about it. But what had he done? He had taught them about the truth concerning the second coming of Jesus and they weren't to be overtaken by the second coming of the Lord in some way where they would be in error in regard to it. What would they to be? They would be sober and on guard. Well, if that's the case about the second coming of Jesus, let's just take our subject today. Have we been enlightened about homosexuality? Is it a sin? Yes, it's a sin. Can it affect the Lord's church? Can it affect you and I as Christians? Yes, it can. Do we need to act like that it can't affect us? We can just put it in the closet and cover it up and shut the door and it's never going to affect anyone around me? Absolutely not. Knowing that it's out there and knowing it can permeate the lives of anyone at any time, we need to be as Christians sober and on guard. Knowing that it can affect our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we don't need to act like that it cannot, and then they feel like there's no way out of it. They need to know there's a place that they can come to and they can find help, that they can find safety. This is God's hospital for all sin, even homosexuality. So yes, we don't need to turn a blind eye to it. And let me say this. If you're in the audience tonight, tonight, this morning, and you're struggling with homosexual feelings, do you know what you need to do? You need to seek godly help. That's what you need to do. You need to seek help for that sin. It's a sin. It'll separate you from God. But I'm standing before you today saying, we're here to help. You know who you need to go to first for help? Your elders. You have men that have been appointed among you to watch out for souls who care for every member of this local church in such a way that they want everyone to get to heaven. And if we have some desire for some type of sin, then they're here to help us to try to guide us out of that, give us a pathway to overcome, pointing us back to God's Word, God's will. Look at verse 12 of chapter 5. Paul writes, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. You know what you need to be? You need to be at peace among, we need to be at peace among ourselves as brethren. We need to be at peace among ourselves as saints and elders because we're going to need these men. We're going to need to go and sit down with them at times and say, I've got a problem. I've got an issue and I'm having trouble with it and I need to find a way to be able to overcome this with God's help. And I'll say this, I'll speak for them. They want you to do that. Don't be afraid to talk to your elders. I don't care if it's about homosexuality. You talk to them about it. They want your soul to be saved. Matter of fact, they're being held accountable for it. Seek their help. I'm not saying they're experts on the matter but they can sure help you. Go there first. And don't get me wrong. It may be that you need some professional help as well. It may, need, may be that you need some counseling in that regard. And that is fine. And do that. But be careful where you go. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 6. Let me make another comparison here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You remember the problem in the beginning of this chapter was that the Christians were suing one another. They were taking their civil problems to the, the law of the world and suing one another and letting the, civil, the worldly courts handle those things. Paul said, that is, that's a problem. Notice verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you, and you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning these things pertaining to this life, 
Do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren? Think about that for a minute. If it was the case that Paul is saying that you Christians are having tr- problems among one another and you, don't, you can't work this out among yourselves, you're having to go to the people of the world who are least esteemed by the church to work out your problems, what did he say that we should do? We should be able to find a wise counselor, mediator, among brethren to be able to come sit down and be able to help us work that matter out. Brethren, let me say this. If that was the case with civil law, how much more with the issue we're talking about today? My point is, you may need some professional counseling, and please go seek it, but don't go to the counselors of the world. Because what have they been? They've been saturated in normalization too. What are they going to tell you? Oh, just be free. Do what's you. Everything's okay. You may be thinking, well, where do I go? Well, if you're struggling with this, I want you to first go and talk to your elders. And your elders can point you to some Christian brotherly, sisterly counselors that are out there and they're there to find who will be able to help you with this issue, who will give you godly guidance, biblical information to help you overcome this in a way they can professionally give you the counseling that you need. And there's where we need to go. We don't need to take these problems to the world. We need to take these problems to to people who can give us godly help. Because the world's just going to lead us astray. What did Paul say about the civil matters? If that way with civil matters, how much more so these matters we're talking about now? But please, get help. If you're having those feelings, don't be so ashamed that you can't come and talk to us and let us give you some help to overcome that. Let us point you to Jesus and let Jesus bring you out of those feelings. Because those feelings, if not acted upon, in a godly way, to fix them are going to lead you to the practice. Let me close by saying this. If you're practicing homosexuality, whether it be LBGT plus T, uh, I don't know all the expressions. I'm trying to be a smart aleck. I just don't. The whole gamut. If you're practicing such things right now, you need to repent or you're going to likewise perish. You're going to lose your soul. I'm standing before you today not to humiliate anyone, if that be the case. I don't know if there's anyone here. That's not why I'm preaching that sermon. I'm saying, we don't know. This issue affects us. And there may very well be someone. And I'm appealing to your heart that if you're struggling with the feelings, get help. If you're practicing it, repent. Come to us. Let us help you then. If such is the case. But let me remind you, here in chapter 6, in verse 9, let me just read it this way. Let me read it specifically. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither homosexuals nor sodomites will inherit the kingdom of God. Just being specific about it. You can't be a member of the body of Christ practicing homosexuality no more than you can being a drunkard. Practicing that, or practicing murder, or practicing thievery, or lying. They're all a sin just the same. And though the world hasn't generalized the rest of those things to the point to where it's been accepted in culture, like homosexuality, homosexuality, though it's been generalized and normalized, it's still a sin. It's one that needs to be dealt with. We need to repent or perish. Don't think that it can't be done. These people did it. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you. They were what? Some of them were homosexuals. Some of them were sodomites. What did they do? They were washed. They were sanctified. They were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What did they do? They stopped. They repented. They ceased the practice of homosexuality and all the other sins that were spoken of there. They turned to the Lord for help. They accessed His grace. They found forgiveness. And they allowed that grace to motivate them to live the life that God had called them to live. We can do that too. All of us can do that. 
And I'm appealing to us. I'm trying to do it in a better way than I've done it in the past. I'm trying to address the issue adequately as a whole. Because I know there could be a possibility. Someone may be in a position like this. We don't want you to think that you can't find a way out. We're here to help. But if we're going to help, then we're going to have to have an understanding. Number one, from both sides, we're going to have to have an understanding that homosexuality is not acceptable in the eyes of God. Let me say this again. Whether it be LBGT plus whatever, none of that is acceptable in the eyes of God. We've read it, and it's very clear. But secondly, let us also understand, brethren, that it does affect us. We can't turn a blind eye to it. We can't give it a shot of truth every once in a while and think that we've taken care of it forever. It doesn't happen that way. No, we've got to have our eyes open and be sober knowing that it can happen at any time and somebody's going to have to deal with it. What do we need to do? We need to seek godly help. If you're feeling having these feelings, seek godly help. Let us try to help you. Find your way out of this mess of sin just like any other mess of sin we want someone to get their way out of. And number three, if you're practicing this, repent. Come find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. You can do it. The Corinthians did it, and you can do it too. Anyone can. This morning, I've tried to present this in a very clear way, and I hope I have. If you have further questions, please come and talk to me. How many times have I said this, and Andrew said this, our doors are open to you. Our elders, I'm speaking for them again, but I know I can. They're willing to talk to you about this issue. They want to. They want to help. Or any other sin problem that you may have, we need to get it fixed. We want to go to heaven. And we can because of the blood of Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we stand ready to help you, whatever that may be. If you need to obey the gospel, we'll help you with that. You can repent 